radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. All right. Good evening, Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Today is Tuesday, Tuesday, April 4th, 2023. Tonight's Craig Campabasso is with us. We're going to be talking about his new book. I have it right here. I am reading it. It's already a little bent up. The UFO Hotspot. We're going to be talking about that tonight, different locations around the country and uh, a few other spots, too, as well, and, uh, and, and, and much more. So that is tonight. And um, Craig, um, over the years, you know, he's been in, in, in uh, film. He's been in television. Um, he has appeared on on many radio shows, including, you know, Coast to Coast and over here. But uh, he's also a producer and he's a casting director. He produced the short film Stranger at the Pentagon, um, which came from, you know, Dr. Frank E. Strange, uh, Strange's book. And um, he also has uh, cast many films. And uh, I've talked about those films on this show And I've talked about the casting of those films. And every time I do that, the director, somebody involved with the, it's all about Craig Capabasso. It's all about Craig. And it is. He is a big part of our UFO community. He's a great friend and he's really talented. And his latest book is out. I've got it. We're going to be talking about all that and much more. Craig's links are below and, of course, over at jimmychurchradio.com. I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black. Seems like I haven't seen him for a couple of days. Yeah, two whole days. (laughs) How you doing, my friend? I'm good. How you doing? That was a great conference, man. I loved it. And, you know, it was in my neck of the woods for a change. It was kind of in your neck of the woods. You know, you didn't have to get on a plane. Uh, there was there was that part, and uh, of course we're talking about the Parapod Festival, and and Craig was there, and he's he's at all the conferences, but um, uh, I I live down the street, and you know about twenty miles away or so, you know uh, you're in the the neighborhood, and I was debating, I was like, man, do I do I get it? Do I get a hotel or do I just drive home every night? I was like, nah, nah. So uh, I ended up staying there and and glad that I did because uh, we just stayed up all night and, you know, I was able to get up early and, and do all of those things. And it was, it was so much fun. You're right though. Right in the hood, man. Right right in the hood. In the hood. Yeah. Did you get a chance um, uh, to go up to Mentryville? No, I did not. Actually, I uh, I was still working on my PowerPoint uh, you know, that day, but I really wanted to go. You know how lame that is of an excuse? <laughs> that, that is just so lame. It was well. So- I, I the the other part was it was four hours long, and I. You know, four hours is a long time. No, you can just, you're Craig Campobasso, man. You do what you want. You just walk around, act like you own the place, <laughs> like you always do. Man, it's right. Talk about in the hood. Yeah. You know, it's a ghost town five minutes from your house. Yeah. Did you know it, it was there? I didn't know Mentryville was there, but I know other stuff that are in New Hall, right? That, um, uh William Hart yeah the yeah. silent film actor that part of uh those properties are haunted yeah completely and yeah completely. and and I have a friend that lives out here who's into all of this stuff and she took me around to a few really haunted places where she said that things come uh that literally people see people staring back at them through the window and and another interesting thing that she told me was right here in Santa Clarita, uh, 
she was at one point living in an apartment that was close to being off the freeway, off the 14. And she was talking on her phone and she had a sliding glass door and uh, on her patio, she turned and looked and there was a teenage Sasquatch standing on her patio looking at her and she totally wigged out and the Sasquatch wigged out and, uh, and she called the police and they said, oh, don't worry, that's, that's monkey boy. We, we know of Monkey Boy. He's very harmless. He comes through the drains and he, he's just very curious. That's and, what the, that, that's what the police said. That's what the police told her is what she told me. So uh, I just found that, that very interesting. I didn't call him a Bigfoot because he was, you know, he was an adolescent. So I don't know what we call adolescent Bigfoots, but. Well, I call him Michael J. Fox. <laughs> Teen Wolf, right? Teen Wolf. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, really quick, I mean, I, I mentioned uh, to you uh, at, at the conference, I've, I've really been enjoying uh, your social media post of late. Not that I didn't enjoy it before. Right. Um, uh, can we can we talk about, well, let's talk about you. <laughs> can we talk sure. about you? Sure. Um, <laughs> your, your post um in it, this is this is what i enjoy about living in los angeles you know this area burbank studio city sherman oaks encino tarzana northridge granada hills it is rich with people that work in film and television that's what everybody does right yeah and everybody has got their stories and and contact. If 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 anybody living in the valley, you know, goes back and visits their family in Nashville, right? They go back to Chicago. Um, you know, hey, have uh, have you ever met Michael J. Fox? Whatever, right? Right. Uh, actually, yeah, I saw him this morning at, at Starbucks. <laughs> And and that's 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 our lives out here, right? And and I'm I'm really used to it. But but you, you're you're in the industry. That's what you do. Um, uh, when you're not writing UFO books, you're a casting director. You're a director. Mm-hmm. You're a screenwriter. You're an author, of course. But um, your career, you've been going back into the archives. And and posting the pictures of the the handsome version of of Craig Campobasso <laughs> with uh, your clients and and people that you have worked with over the years. Yeah, I'm just like I'm I'm I don't know who's going to pop up next. Elvis, you know who's going to pop up next in your social media feed? Uh, it, it's uh, tell everybody about your career and who you've worked with. Well, I started acting when I was 15, and then uh, I graduated high school at age 17. I moved out of my parents' house. I worked two jobs, supported myself in my own one-bedroom apartment in the Valley, Uh, and then I got offered a job on David Lynch's Dune, and I worked on that for four years. And uh, the first year, it was just me, David, Raffaella, De Laurentiis, and a couple of secretaries. So, um, you know, so we all got to know each other really, really well. And uh, it was sort of my tutelage into learning all about the film business, right? In every way, shape, and form. You know, I loved Anthony Masters, who, you know, was our um, production designer, and um, uh, Jane Jenkins cast the film. So I was there. I got to sit between Rafaela and Jane when we screen tested all the guys for Paul Maud Dib. Uh, you know, that was really uh, exciting. You know, a lot of people don't know. I mean, Kevin Costner, when he wasn't famous yet, he, he screen tested. Val Kilmer actually was pretty much Paul Maud Dib up until the point Kyle McLaughlin was found. And you know, I, mean, I, I could see, I could see, I could see Val doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Val in that part. Yeah. Yeah. He, he hung out with us a lot because he was the leading contender until one of uh, Jane's um, associates, Elizabeth Lustig found Kyle up in a uh, theater up in Seattle 
Uh, we flew him down. I went and picked him up at the airport. I brought him to the hotel, got him, you know, told him to uh, change. I was going to take him to go meet David. And uh, he met David and David was very excited about him. And then uh, the screen test proved it. I mean, even in my young, young age, I mean, once he did it, I was just like, that's the guy, that's the guy. And, you know, I remember Rafaela sort of leaning over to me and she said, do you think we should change his last name? And I said, no, no, he's got a great last name. <laughs> what did he do first, Blue Velvet or Dune? No, he did Dune first. Dino okay. signed him to an eight picture deal, just like he signed Jessica Lang to an eight picture deal when she did uh, King Kong. And she didn't want to do a lot of those movies, so she didn't work for quite some time. And um, anyway, I saw her a few years ago. I'm not, I, I don't know her. I, I was at an event for uh, that uh, show she did for Ryan Murphy with uh, Joan Crawford, where she played Joan Crawford. Yeah, well, and I she did uh, well, American Horror Story too. Yes, yeah, American Horror Story. She, uh, anyway, I went up and I said, "Look, I said, you know, you got your start with Dino De Laurentiis. I got my start." And she and she said a few expletives in, in a good way, saying, "And we are both blank blank still here." <laughs> have so. you forgotten more than you remember because once you once you're in you know the flow of of production and casting and and working with production companies this stuff goes by like a blur do you yeah. go back and go that's right i worked with burt reynolds or you know oh that's right i forgot i i i did that do you find yourself doing that well, I will tell you, when I was a kid, I the, the people I wanted to meet and work with were Mel Brooks, Burt Reynolds, Phyllis Diller, Dom DeLuise, uh, you know, all the funny, great comedians. And uh, when I was on uh, Spielberg's Amazing Stories is when I first got to work with Burt, and he, uh, he directed one of the episodes. And he was one of the kindest people I had ever met. In fact, there's a little autograph picture of him right there. He just brought it into me one day and I had already signed it and gave it to me. And, um, you know, I'll tell you a funny story. He said, you know, Craig, I don't know where the set is uh, on the soundstage. Can you take me there? And I said, well, do you want to go the way of the tour buses or do you want to go around the back way? He goes, oh, the tour buses, of course. So <laughs> we go and one one bus is coming down and I, we don't really hear the guy talking over the thing. And it was a group of um, Japanese tourists who didn't speak English. So they weren't really saying anything over the calm and you know Bert's standing there and and he's like okay now we're waiting for the next one <laughs> right so so we waited for it and and it came down and of course they all went crazy and uh the tram stopped and everybody got pictures of them so um i uh my next door neighbor was an actor uh his name is Eamon roche and you, you might even know Eamon, and, and uh, he was in The Mask with uh, Jim Carrey and a bunch of films, and yeah. he was in uh, this Rodney Dangerfield uh, film yeah. with Burt Reynolds, right? And so I'm, I'm, I'm watching the movie, and there's this scene uh, with Eamon and, and Burt uh, alone in this room. They're d doing this thing, and Burt slaps him, right? Right. It's 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 in the scene. And and I'm like, man, that looked like it stung. Like, I don't think that was a sound effect, right? Right. <laughs> right. So um Eamon, who had given me the DVD and were uh passing in the hallway, um uh we lived next door to each other. I go, dude, can I ask you a question? And he goes, yeah, man. I said, Burt Reynolds. Yeah, man. He really slapped me. <laughs> he said, Burt, Burt turned to him and he goes, okay, man, we're acting now. Okay. So just go with it. Yeah, man. You know, he's like, man, it's Burt Reynolds. And he, we're doing our thing. And he just went, what? Black. <laughs> I took it. 
I took it. It's Bert. And he uh, said, it was great. And I was like, I knew that was real. Oh, man, it was just so funny. But Bert said, man, get ready, man. We're acting here. He, he was the coolest. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I got to work with him several times. The last time was on a movie uh, with him, Raquel Welch, uh, which was so exciting for me because, you know, I've always been a big fan of hers. Phyllis Diller. I mean, the, the cast just went on and on and on. It was like so much fun. And, um, you know, and I look back and, you know, we've lost all these people now. And, uh, you know, and I did finally get to work with Mel Brooks on two projects. Uh, thank God we still have him. Yeah. So, yeah. No kidding. Uh, yeah. His new uh, History of the World Part Two is hysterical. Oh, man. Yeah. Wanda Sykes is one of my favorite oh, comedians shit. ever, ever. Well, it, you know, everybody in that, um, uh, first off, Mel's a brilliant writer. This time around, though, um, he he's he, he's he's not concerned about being PC. He never was, but I'm talking about in today's world. Right. And, and and no, no, it's it's still Mel, but he is really pushing the boundaries of of good taste, and I love that. Yeah. That's what comedy is about, man. Just exactly. pushing. Um, our good friend Camille Harmon uh, is in the chat. Another great actor, right? There's <laughs> there's Camille. Camille, how you doing? Um, so, okay. Um, uh, how did you? Uh, th this is this is how I segue into UFOs. Uh, yeah. You know where I've done uh, two, three thousand uh, interviews. Um, I can do this pretty smoothly now. How did you? <laughs> how did you go <laughs> from uh, that career into the world of UFOs? Um, or, or are they closer than than we can imagine? Well, you know, it's it's interesting because. Uh... I never had an interest in UFOs, uh, never thought about what was out there in the big wide cosmos. Uh, I was just, you know, your average Valley guy, went to work, went out, you know, hung out with my friends on the weekend, that kind of stuff. And uh, after I had finished uh, the second season on Amazing Stories is when I say my own amazing story began because I had a major spiritual awakening where I went from being totally dormant to being quite awake at the end of two years, being taken through this sort of whirlwind of um, uh, awakening, which uh, I can only explain it as if all the cells in the body woke up and started communicating all of my past and started connecting into the universe and connecting into other worlds, other societies. Um, I would uh, see it. I would astral travel to these places and all of that. So how that's how it opened up for me. I'm well, just giving you wait, wait, you can't, you can't just gloss over that. Yeah. What, what caused that? I mean, well, I mean that's that's a serious stopping of the car. It is. It and is making a right hand turn. Well, it it began um, uh, with in the regular dream state. I would see these three beings. Two were extremely tall with very elongated heads. One was a male. One was a female, uh, wearing these incredible robes with. Uh, a zillion lights in them and then a uh a blonde female woman as well and i would see them in the dream and then i would wake up and i would just feel um very safe and i would feel that there was a lot of love that was coming from them and then it would just be out of my mind and this happened almost every night for a two month period then the next two months I would be there in the dream and then I would wake up in the dream and realize that my soul body was where they were. How old were you? 
I was 26 when this began. Were you smoking really good weed? No, 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 no. I never like I never like pot at all. Right. So, yeah. right. You know, I'm, I'm, yeah. I say that in jest, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. But that, well, not really, maybe. Um, but uh, at, at that age, um, to have a clear mind, right, yes. without outside influences, and to have this go on. Do you start thinking you're 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 going crazy? And did you talk to your friends about it? Um, I didn't think that I was going crazy, and I did talk to all of my friends about it, and they didn't really understand it, but they right. didn't ridicule me for it either because we were all uh, all just trying to figure it out. I did see a metaphysical counselor who helped me through it, um, and. Uh, and then the last two months, which would be the six months, would be I would go through those first two processes. Then I would wake up and their astral forms would be at the foot of my bed. Oh, man. Well, and OK, my so, first my, my response to that is that's friggin cool. Yeah. But that's also uh, pretty insane. You know, and were you were you considering what this may be something that uh, is real um, and is interdimensional that is reaching out some kind of entanglement, you know, some kind of quantum connection, or did you think that it was real, but real that it was manifested, uh, uh, you know, from your own mind and consciousness? No, I, at first I just sort of thought they were dreams until I started seeing the astral forms in my bedroom and then, uh, and then after that six month period, those beings fed into my body a golden light that ballooned into me. And what it did is it, it woke up all the cells in my body. And for the next eight months, every time I saw something like, every time I saw the beauty behind the creation of something in my daily life, whether it was a person, a plant, a ladybug, whatever it was, I would sob profusely for eight to 10 minutes or up to 12 minutes. And I just couldn't believe how beautiful everything was. Now, this also happened, you know, I had my casting office on Sunset Boulevard overlooking the whole city at that time. And if an actor walked in, all of a sudden I could feel their soul history and I could feel if they were right for the role or not. But then I would feel the beauty behind their soul history because of the diversity that they, they've had to overcome. Right. Right? right. right. And I would have to excuse myself and go sob in the other room and then come back in. I honestly think I was never going to stop sobbing. Right. So after that, then all of a sudden, uh, then they uh, ignited my light body, which is when I started astral traveling. And then, of course, during meditations um, in the mind Internet is when I began uh, starting to interact with other beings in this mind internet. Sometimes they said something, sometimes they did not, right? Yeah. It's a very interesting process because you get a click in the back of your neck here, it goes like that. And then all of a sudden they're vibrating on your inner eyelids. And it's like, I'm looking at you now as like how I was looking at them. So the, the whole process of this, was for uh, is what they had uh, brought to me and said is that I had come here to be a writer and that they wanted me to sit down and uh, start writing longhand on a legal pad, write and write and write until I could write no more, don't stop, don't edit, keep going. And so I did this and I was actually writing a book that it felt like I was reading, but it was coming through my mind and through my hand. Now, I didn't know what channeling was. Automatic I didn't know writing. automatic yeah. writing. I didn't know what any of that was. I was so young and naive. 
And so that's how it began. And that's, and that's how the books, uh, my book series, The Autobiography of an Extraterrestrial Saga, were born. So this is their information that they wanted to bring here to earth. And there's so many incredible spiritual learning and lessons and, and all of that. And the lead character, um, it's interesting, the lead character is a Pleiadian man, uh, but he's dualistic. Now up there, everyone is fully conscious, but in every 200,000 births, there'll be somebody born dualistic. And this is so that the dualistic person will have fully conscious people to feed off of, and the fully conscious people will become more understanding of how dualistic people are in their makeup, right? So anyway, so we go along the journey of this man, and we, we the reader, become him, and we learn how to become fully conscious by book three. Did you see uh, Camille's comment? No, I didn't. I, I didn't. Oh, let me look. She, no, it, it's right there in front oh, of there you. there we go. She says, wow, casting with soul history. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, it's so that, true. It's that, so true. That, that is just awesome. And so, um, uh, which, I, I don't want that to get away from me. So let, let's back up for a second. Right. What was the, uh, what was the alien love story that Daryl Anka did? Alienated. A alienated. Alienated. You yeah. cast that. I did. Yeah. And uh, and uh, this this is, look. I, I'm old. I don't have a brain. Um, but the star, her name is uh, Grace. I can't remember her last yeah, name. Okay. Loved her. She's so she's so off planet. I just well, love her. That's my question, right? Yeah. So, yeah. You know, as a as a casting director, and like you said, you know, you've got you you, you know people are coming in and and you're seeing straight through them. <laughs> yeah. And and what did you think? Because she, um, I went to Daryl. I called Daryl um, before he was on the show. Um, I had I had seen the movie, and so I'm, I'm in. You know, I just I'm in the car, and I picked up the phone and called Daryl, and he's like, "What's up?" And I said, "Hey, Daryl. You know, I don't want to interrupt your day." Grace, he goes. Yeah, she's amazing. Huh? I go, dude. <laughs> and he goes, you can thank Craig. I said, Campo Basso. He goes, yeah. I said, man, it, yeah. she was so perfect for that part. What did you see? Okay, so everybody, if you haven't seen Alienated, it's a love story, and she's the ET, right? Yes. She's the alien ET, and uh an uh, an earth bound <laughs> human uh uh boy man uh uh young but i guess would would he be uh, maybe 2021 20, teenager well no she's there they were like mid 20s mid 20s, mid -20s okay. to to late 20s that kind okay, of but, thing but younger uh, you know not uh not old anyway um, and that's what it is. It's a love story between an ET and a human. And a human, yeah. And it is so well. Every all the casting in it uh, was fantastic. Grace, Grace embraced that part. I mean, she. Grace, what, yeah. what did you see in her? Well, the minute I met her, I you know you just get a vibe. You just get a a feeling. Uh, it just clicked, and I really felt that uh, she was really an old soul, a really evolved soul. And, and we all know what that means. You're not from here. You're here visiting. You could be a star seed. You could just be coming in and, you know, learning about duality or whatever, because all planets are schools, right? Or sure. this planet teaches du duality. And, uh, and when I brought her to Daryl, uh, Daryl and Erica, his wife, they both looked at me and they go, yep, she's it. She's it. And I said, yeah. So, uh, and the same for the guy, you know, we, we, it was between two guys and, uh, this is the one that we chose, uh, to also go with. And, uh, although both, all, both guys were like fantastic. So if anybody wants to see it, you can see it for free on Amazon prime.
Yeah, it's, it's it's just a great film. I enjoyed it uh, so much. Grace Gracie Lacy. Gracie Lacy. That's it. Gracie Lacy. Man. Yeah. Now, um, okay, uh, I'm I'm gonna leave Alien Aided alone, but I just have one more comment. The waitress at the restaurant who played her, she was amazing. She was amazing. <laughs> I don't, I don't remember. Yeah, see, I don't remember. I mean, you know, I've cast so many movies. Yeah, so you, many. well, you have it right there, don't you? Do you have uh, it I, up? Do you have uh, it up on IMDb? I'm pulling up IMDb now. I didn't before. Um. Oh no, no, Gracie Lacey popped in my head. That's how I used to remember her name. Okay. Oh right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Michael Aaron Carrico. That's the guy that played uh, the guy. Yes. And then um, was it Rachel Strutt? Did she play the waitress? Rachel Rachel played. Um, she was the mom, I think. She was the mom. Yeah, I can't. I can't. Let, let me see. She was. I cannot find. She was, yeah, she was the mom to David, to the guy, the the guy. That's uh, right. She Michael. Was yeah, yeah, she, yeah, yeah. That's who that was. I'm just trying to see. No, I, 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 don't, I don't remember who the waitress was. Yeah, I don't see it here. Um Okay, anyway, she was great. And, and and things like this always stick in my head. And I I just remember that waitress and those restaurant scenes were so funny and uh were so well done. And uh, the film itself was just casted perfectly. Um uh, you know, from be from beginning to end. And for um and this was my comment, uh, and, and and again, Daryl just kept going, Oh, you that's on Craig, man. That's on Craig. And which was um, for an independent film, this thing was acted. You know, everybody was 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 really doing their job, and, yeah. and that's a rare thing. You know, you see independent films sometimes you get the gems, you know, but right. more times than not, um, you you have to make sacrifices when it comes to the cast. And uh, somebody's not pulling their weight, right? If you know, right. I mean. but not in this film. No, this film was was fantastic, man. It was it was a great script too, as well. But yes, um, but of course, Gracie Lacey and for an alien love story, you know, it's, it's which a is which is great. And you know, we did before that we did uh, Bashar First Contact, which was Daryl's whole story of how he got into channeling and, you know, I got to cast Daryl when he was younger and uh, all the people around him and uh, all of that. So that is also a really good film if people haven't seen that. Yeah. I, um, I really enjoyed that film too, as well. And yeah. And I get to see the Valley, you know? Yeah, and, exactly. <laughs> guy. And that's uh, right. You know, when, whenever uh, somebody says they're from the Valley, I'll give them the test. Okay, which Jerry's do you prefer? Right? I'll, I'll throw something just to make sure the one on Pettit okay. or the one on Coldwater. Right. And, uh, you know, feel somebody out. Where, what was the cross street? The Tower <laughs> Video. You know? And, That's right. That's right. That's see, right. You, you find out really quickly. If That's somebody's right. actually from the valley, because yes. somebody will say uh, Sepulveda Boulevard, and I go, dude, you're not from the valley. <laughs> <laughs> Sepulveda, that's great. I never heard that one. <laughs> All right, okay, that's yeah, funny. And by the way, but before we move on, um, for all the Dune fans. Um, there is a brand new, uh, it's only online. You have to search it out. I can't remember, uh, the exact name of it, but, uh, they made a documentary based on the making of the 1984 one. I'm in the documentary quite a bit. Uh, it's, it's really well put together. So 
Uh, you can just rent it online. And also there's a wonderful writer named Max Every, uh, who has uh, just finished uh, writing a book based on the 1984 film where he interviewed all of us as well. And this is the very first time that David Lynch has given an interview on Dune forever. So what, uh, what's it called? Uh, let me see. Let me see if I can find it in my uh, thing here. Hold because on. everybody talks about, uh, uh, you know, Joe Dorowski's Dune. Oh, uh, I, I think it's called The Sleeper Must Awaken, actually. Oh, The Sleeper Must Awaken. Yeah, The Sleeper. Uh, I think it's called The Sleeper Must Awaken. That chat, put that in there and just say documentary. See if it comes up. Ba, 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 ba. Yeah, here it is. Right okay, here. good. Good, good, good. Yeah, it's really, really good. So, um, you know, again, I worked on it four years. So I, uh, you know, they put me in there quite a bit. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna watch this tonight. This is this is completely. Oh, awesome. it's so good! It's so good. And the book by Max Avery. I'm not sure what he's calling it. Every E V R Y. Uh, it'll be out in the fall. He told me. So um, again, he uh, uh, he got he interviewed David Lynch, Raffaella, of course, Kyle. I got a lot of the other actors to get interviewed as well, including our incredible costume designer, uh, Bob Ringwood, who did Excalibur and uh, all of that. So everybody's back for this particular book, uh, which will be out uh, soon. So I'm not sure if it'll be called Doom 1984 or what it will be called. But uh, I, um, uh, I, I almost got... Uh, david lynch on the show about five years ago four years ago and no I, way I, yeah so i reached out to him and and i got a couple of replies right and I thought, yeah Man. and it was when uh the new uh twin peaks had just come out on showtime so which which i thought was bleeping fantastic um uh it's kind of hard to top the original but i thought it was i thought it was just absolutely excellent anyway so i reached out and and, and this is what he says and i'm kind of into painting at the moment mm -hmm. and, uh, i'm painting i said well why you know well i don't know how long that's going to be Oh man, I, I I just had to let it go. Had to let it, it go. Yeah, when he gets focused on one thing, you know, he's really he's really focused on it. Like back during Dune, he made these things called fish kits. He would dissect a fish and then have all its parts and photograph it and then write what each part was. So I still have my fish kit signed to me from oh, David Lynch. <laughs> oh man, what was um, uh, I, okay? So Martin Short, um, uh, Jiminy Glick in Hollywood, right? Right. Uh, fantastic comedy, unreal. Martin Short's impersonation of David Lynch in that movie, and and then and I had to go back and look to see if it actually wasn't David Lynch uh, the the way that it was done. Um, just yeah. fantastic. I, I love David Lynch. So when um, uh, did you have, because we go from the meditative state, right? Right. Or channeling or what, but um, then there is the, the physical side of, of seeing craft and, and, and seeing things. When did that first happen? Well, you know, I just got so involved in it and so interested. I used to go and hear um, contactees speak. I would go, uh, I started going to conferences. That's where I met a lot of people. I started going on investigations. I started meeting MUFON people. Um, and I just started getting more and more involved in it. And the more, you know, it, it's, it's like, you've probably heard a million stories. I've heard not that many, but when you hear them, you're just like, you're so blown away because each thing is so different and out there. 
in, in the sense of some of the, the contactees and things like that and the things that happened to them and some of the physical proof that I've seen as well. I mean, one, one gentleman uh, came to my house. He, he was so freaked out. A, a friend of his uh, knew me and said, would you please talk to him? He came to my house and he literally lifted up his eyelids and the bottom of his eyes and all around both eyeballs, the aliens had implanted this thing that went around the back of his eyes. And he said, they are seeing everything I see and it's freaking me out. And he said, I want to go have them removed, but I'm so f they would take out my eyeballs. And then what if I couldn't see? And, you know, and then what if they took them out and it was fine? And then I couldn't, uh, and then would they put them back? Right. You know, so this was a little different than, you know, what we were used to with Dr. Roger Lear. Yeah, right? This was an actual eye implant. Right. So um, on both eyes, which was interesting. Now, I had heard of uh, contactees and experiencers talking about when they could feel uh, uh, otherworldly beings looking through their eyes. Right. But that was a that's a different kind of experience. This man had physical things going on. So it was. Uh, yeah, that one. That one really threw me for a loop. I, I, I lost contact with him and I, I always wondered, you know, how he fared and uh, all of that. But so I, you know, so then I started, you know, of course, going to places like Sedona with night vision binoculars and you see craft way up in the sky. Sometimes you'll see a group of them just flitting by as fast as they can go. Um, I caught uh, on camera when I was driving down towards Courthouse Butte and um, Bell Rock. You know, I had my my uh, camera phone. It was probably I don't know, like '90s, late '90s, early 2000s, and I saw this metallic ball this big going like this right along the side of the road. I got my camera out and I was able to snap a photograph of it, which I put in the book, right? Under the Sedona part. And, um, you know, and then also, which was interesting, they also put in here, I'll see if I can find it before you. Uh, also, when I was on Bell Rock, in 1998, I was uh, a friend took some photographs of me, and then just and then I was just taking some pictures, and what appeared were gigantic orbs, right, the size of a person, like it would come up to my shoulder. That's how big it was, and um, I one of those photographs is actually in the book. Uh, what you can't see is the patterns that are going on through the milky white substance, right? And then there's another photograph of me with one of those giant orbs bumped up against my body. Like you see it like forming against my body and there's a wisp of uh, like a thread of this white light coming off that is sort of like uh, inserted into my arm. Now, I showed these to um, several psychics um, and some were quite famous and notable. And they all said the same thing. They said, those, those are angelic consciousness. The, um, uh, the area, let's talk about Sedona first. Sure. Yeah, let's let's get that out of the way. My um, uh, uh, my trip to Sedona, I was there with uh, Adrian Valera. And so we go up to the airport, right? And we're with Michael of Sedona, right? Everybody knows Michael and he's great. So he takes us up to the airport, it's just the three of us. And uh, we've all got night vision and stuff. But the the best thing of the night 
was without night vision. In fact, it was one of the craziest things I've ever seen in my life. So we're facing Sedona uh, for everybody out there. The airport is above Sedona. It's on this plateau. Yeah. It's very freaky, actually, how they have the airport up on this flat bluff. <laughs> you know? Yeah, they do. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's above, way above the city. So we were up on the edge of the cliff um, looking out over the city, which is down way below us. And and so from behind us, I don't know which direction we would be facing. I think we're, uh, that's north maybe. I don't know. But we're over, overlooking the city. From behind us, I just kind of glanced over my shoulder, just I'm, you know, looking at the sky. And and Craig, this low flying, it was white and round. Could have been a ball, but it could have been a disc. I don't know, but because it was so low. Comes over slow. Not that high. I'm going to say a couple thousand feet. You know, not 80,000 feet, right? Low. And it right. just goes right over. Just and it and just just at an angle, came over our shoulder. We just stood there and watched it. And then it went over the city and then disappeared behind the trees in in front of us. And I was like, what? <laughs> what? No, 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 no. You're not expecting right. something like that. It was, it was, it was crazy. It was crazy. I couldn't make out a shape, but it was white. Right. And uh, and it took its time. This wasn't like, you know, gone. No, it just kind of meandered and went just went right over the top of us. Pretty big, pretty good yeah. size, and uh disappeared behind the trees. That's Sedona, man. It, you know, you it tell is. you tell that story to anybody that's been there, like, yeah, okay, see that every day. <laughs> they basically, yeah, they basically do. I mean, there's a, a friend of mine, researcher there. Uh, he talks of three bases being in that area there, which uh, he believes are joint military uh, extraterrestrial bases as well. Um, over all the years, I went there the first time for the first harmonic convergence in the mid 80s. And even back then, we were seeing uh, the black op helicopters flying like sometimes two and three of them over the city back and forth and that kind of thing. So what is, what is it about Sedona? It is, it is truly a hot spot. It is. And I, I think what I'll do is I'm just, I'm just going to go into the, the most interesting hot spot, in, which is just lays outside of Sedona in the Verde Valley. And it's called the Bradshaw ranch. Yep. Right mm -hmm. now I've heard of the Bradshaw ranch because I had a friend who actually worked there when it was a working ranch. And she would just tell me these very interesting stories uh, about being there. And she said, you know, Craig, it's in the middle of nowhere. If you don't know how to get there, you're never going to find it. Right. So um, anyway, finally, once I, I went out and I stayed with her and I said, uh, let's let's go out to the ranch. So. We drove my car. It's not a four wheel, so you can only drive to a certain point. We had to hike in for about 40 minutes to get there, right? Now, this is my first experience. You're walking down a wash, which is basically the road, and you can see all the cables that are that are now, um, you know, the dirt is uncovered that were cables leading out, which I guess went into, plugged into something, you know, to power the ranch. And on both sides are all of this brush and everything. As I'm walking, and of course, you know, ever since I was a kid, I, I've been a very um, strong sentient. I can sense and feel things when they're around. And as we're walking, I could feel all of these dimensional portals being opened, and I could feel things looking at me, although I couldn't see them. Right now, of course, this is in the middle of the day, and I'm thinking to myself, what would it be like here at night? Right. So, the stories that my friend told were that Bob Bradshaw's uh, 
uh, I'm not sure if it was second or third wife, Linda, had a, a, a son around 20. They were living on the ranch. So this is like, I think, 200 plus acres of land that he bought. They built a ranch. Um, in the front of the ranch home, they ultimately built a saloon, which is when people would come, he would do rodeo shows, cowboy shows, all of that. And, uh, and then they'd have the saloon where people could drink and eat and dance and do all kinds of fun stuff. Now, on the first night that they opened up one of the shows, my friend said a, she was sitting in the bleachers and a flying saucer went right over them. And she said that was like one of the most uh, unbelievable experiences. Now she's seen a lot there living in Sedona for a very long time. She's seen these things now, but she also told me about Linda Bradshaw that, um, that on the property, there was an albino Sasquatch, right? I've heard and, this. Yes. And that, Linda got the idea after seeing the footprints to leave it out by the stables, which is maybe a five, seven minute walk from the ranch, right? And she put a plate of fruits and vegetables out and put it up on one of the, you know, posts. And the next day she would come out, all the food be gone and the Bigfoot would gift her sticks and stones and she would see the prints and that kind of thing. And then, um, uh, have you ever had Tom Dongo on your show? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So Tom Tom researched that ranch when Linda was there for four years, right? So I, I went over everything extensively with him. And he called Linda and said, you know, make sure that you uh, do everything you can to protect your mares because aliens are stealing the fetuses on other ranches. Right. But what Linda would notice is on her pregnant mare's belly, she would find white hairs. Right. So she felt like she was really protecting the mare, the mare's uh, unborn uh, child. Um, what do you call horses? Foes? Foes? Yeah. 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 So uh, anyway, so full, she. Full, 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 full. full. You're, yeah. you're, you're a foe. <laughs> Those are foes. But then F O F O W L, right? F -O -W -L. No, F O E L. F O E L. All right. So you are anyway, <laughs> so she did, she did have, she did have the baby and they did see the footprints. Now here's the interesting thing where the investigations and things got a little, uh, really out there is that the son when he would videotape things, or if he would do things with a camera, the dimension would open up. And once they saw what they called Big Girl, that's what they, Linda called the albino Sasquatch, and there was a UFO above her, right? And another time they got a dinosaur. Another time they got a telephone pole. And these are in different areas, right? Right. And um, so this was, this was always very fascinating. Now, the, the, um, on the property throughout the years, uh, once they heard the dogs barking at, and they were looking up at something and they went out there and when they were near the dogs, they saw them like looking up, barking, and they heard this horrific hissing right? Like a really evil hiss. And uh, so they got the dogs in the house and the next morning they went out and they found reptilian footprints where that had taken place. Now there's the oldest homestead house in Sedona on that property. And her son and his girlfriend and her young daughter decided to stay out. So it's more towards the far back of the property, right? And uh, he gets woken up by some lights. He looks out and um, sees a ship land and sees greys get out. And they're running around uh, the property investigating. He's freaked out. The girlfriend's freaked out. They're trying to figure out how are they going to get out of there. 
And then when they didn't see them, they ran to the car, they hightailed it up to the ranch, woke his mother up and uh, told her the story. And as they're telling her the story, a gray walks by the front living room window. Now, Linda has been confronted with this stuff. So she immediately ran and opened the door and it vanished. Right. Right. So um, and Bob wanted nothing to do with any of this kind of stuff, from what I understand. Because well, what, happened, what, what happened with Bob um, is he was out on the property uh, one day and he sees a craft go overhead and and go down over the hill where they had some apple trees right mm -hmm. i wouldn't necessarily say an apple orchard but they had apple trees and uh so he you know he comes over the top of the the rise and looks down and there is a silver disc parked behind one of the apple trees sitting is sitting in the field there and he lost his mind yeah he yeah. saw that, he turned around, went home, and from what I understand, he never came out of the house again. Like ever. Yeah, right. He's, he wanted nothing to do with it. He no, wasn't no. a part of the investigations or any anything like that. I mean, uh, one other incident that was really, well, two, that I find very fascinating is, you know, they had trucks, they were in the front, in the front at night, they heard this crunching and they went out and the trucks were doing this and being squeezed and they took photographs and you could see this white blue energy force around them. Right. And uh, which right, right next to the ranch, there is what they call an alligator tree, which Linda said is a portal for positive and negative entities. So they know they always knew when the negative entities came on, all these negative things would happen on the property. And when the more benevolent ones would come, uh, things would be very happy and very nice and they could feel an inner interchange between them. Now the son was coming home one night with his friend in the middle of the night coming down that wash thing and walking out in front of him was what looked like a miniature horse, maybe five feet, four feet tall with a cat head. It had a literal cat head on it and it had a horse's tail and its fur, they said, came all the way down to the ground. Now, Dongo says that at the same time that he spotted that, there was another incident in another state where someone saw the same being. Now, so what we're wondering is, okay, is it the same creature that's going in and out of pockets of time, mm -hmm. right? Because we know if you, if you ever visit the Bradshaw Ranch, you will feel the interdimensional shift there. It is like the veil is so thin that it it will it will disrupt you to the core in the sense of you know that something could happen at any minute, but you don't know what, right? By the windmill, people have had missing time. Yeah, I've heard that too as well. Yeah, yeah. I didn't I didn't get a chance to go up there. It was it was I I had planned to go up there. Um, it was just one of those things where uh, time got away from us. <laughs> yeah. No pun intended. Uh, uh, time got away from us. And um, uh, I was told, you know, to go up there during the day now and not to go up there at night because yeah. there's a lot of homeless. Uh, uh, there's a homeless encampment uh, that is that is on the road on the way up there. And so you do that at night and, you know, right. You People don't know what to know you're up there alone. It's a, it's best. Now I don't know. Uh, I, I haven't been there. So, uh, and I don't want to say anything that is, that, that is out of place or incorrect, but that's what I was told by, uh, by from the locals. Right. Um, so I just didn't get a chance to get up there. It's one of those things, man. It's a bucket list. Uh, so if is, is Sedona, um, is Sedona your number one, if you were, you know, you got your UFO hotspot bucket list, right? And you're handing it out to your friends and you're going, okay, this is, you start here. Is Sedona at the top of that list? 
Sedona definitely is at the top of the list. Uh, one of the current hotspots is Marina del Rey right here, where there is so much activity going on. I've been talking to uh, Dr. Robert Scheip a lot, and he's been sending me all the things that he is catching daily um, on there. I think it's uh, his website's called custodianfile.com if people want to go and uh, check out a lot of these uh, videos. He says that these little things, when any kind of ship, whether it's extraterrestrial, uh, um, a helicopter, a police helicopter, that these little things go out and they ping them. They, these things fly through the air and they, they ping whatever crafts are in the area. So I don't know. I've never heard of that before. So I thought that was interesting. What I, I have to ask the same thing uh, before. You know what? I've got to take a break. Well, okay. let's, let me get this in before the break. Um, you know, the, the modern sightings that are going on in that area, Marina del Rey, Santa Monica, uh, you know, uh, up and down the coast. You can go from Laguna all the way up to Malibu, right? That whole stretch yeah. of coast. What is going on there? Because the sightings go back to uh, the, the 50s, 40s of Battle of Los Angeles, for example. That's, that's where yeah. this happened. And, of course, we've got Catalina Island out there, and then we've got yeah. the Nimitz, and we've got all the other stuff that has been happening with UAPs. Uh, Caroline Corey and her film, A Terror in the Sky, that takes place right there. Yeah. Uh, what, what is it about this area, Craig? Well, I, I know a lot of people that live on the coast in Malibu, Santa Monica. They have always told me because they live right there. So their living room, bedroom windows look out into the ocean. And they say that they see craft leaving the water and entering the water uh, all the time. Now, so my, my feeling is, is just like there's bases underground, that there's bases underwater as well, because we know these ships can easily glide into the water. They can move through the water quite easily as they can through the air. And uh, so we just, of course, call those USOs, unidentified uh, submerged objects. Uh, uh, Ronald Reagan had his sighting out there? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. You know, uh, it's... it's uh... It's a crazy, crazy area, and it's nearly a guarantee, right? It, it, you know, there are a few spots, you know, Sedona, uh, Joshua Tree. Uh, maybe we'll come back and talk about Joshua Tree, but I want to yeah. also cover some other uh, spots around the country. Um, but um, it's a guarantee. It's a strange situation that we find ourselves in, and there's that there's a deep trench. It gets really deep in between Marina del Rey and Catalina. There's a trench yeah. there. Right. Um, we have that spot up that you know that uh, that I sort of made famous uh, in Malibu. The under right. the under I, I called it a an underwater UFO base at the time. I didn't have a a, a better thing to name it. Um, right. but, uh, it, right there, there are site Preston Dennett. How many books can he write about that area? Right. It's yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, uh, so, all right, let's take our break. Our guest tonight, Craig Campobasso. The new book is called the UFO hotspot. This is fade to black. This is Jimmy church of fade to black. Please visit all of our sponsors. We're taking a quick break here. All of the links are below and we'll be right back. This is Jimmy Church, and I want to introduce you to Life Waves X39 Stem Cell Activation Patch, which has totally transformed my health, my sleep, brain, and my eyes. I no longer need reading glasses. 
X39 is a true breakthrough in regenerative science. Using light, X39's patented age reversal technology is clinically proven to signal the activation of younger stem cells, accelerating the body's natural healing process. X39 promotes restoration and rejuvenation, bringing the life-changing benefits that I've experienced. By naturally elevating a master signaling peptide in the body, X39 boosts vitality, health and wellness, and resets 4,000 genes to a younger, healthier state. It's one patch, once a day, and you can turn back time with X39. Just go to HealingWorksNow.com. That's works with an X. HealingWorksNow.com. Hey, everybody. It's Billy Carson, also known as Forbidden Knowledge. I want to talk to you about a very special event coming up July 30th, 2023, the Forbidden Conscious Awards. We're going to honor people who have been contributing to the conscious community for decades. People that you know and love that have helped you get to higher levels of thought and consciousness and awareness. It's going to be a live in-person event, but seats are going to sell out very fast. You want to make sure you're there in person. And guess what? You can help vote for the winners. Voting is available on ForbiddenKnowledge.com. And the categories are going to be social media influencer, podcast slash radio host, TV host, actor, director, producer, entrepreneurs, health and wellness, philanthropists, authors, field researchers, archaeologists, space anomaly hunters, and of course, a Lifetime Achievement Award. I'll be your key note speaker that night at the Forbidden Conscious Awards. We have celebrity guests performing. We'll have a halftime show where we're actually going to perform music for you. And don't forget about the pre-event mixer where if you buy a box seat, you'll be in the VIP section and you also have private access to a VIP mixer with celebrity guests. Shake hands, break bread, network, and then walk the red carpet with us and take amazing photos. It's going to be a night to remember. You don't want to forget this. Make sure you hurry up and get your tickets because they're selling out very fast. I want to see you there. Forbidden Conscious Awards 2023. April 7th through the 14th, 2023, I'll be hosting and presenting on the Hidden Secrets Seminar at Sea Cruise. From Los Angeles to the Mexican Riviera on the Navigator of the Seas. That's right, up top, a giant water slide. You've got to check out the Navigator of the Seas. It's amazing. We've got Scott Walter, Adam Apollo, Nick Pope, Brad Olson, Vivian Chauvet, Jason Shirka, Robert Grant, Ruben Langdon, and another 12 amazing speakers and presenters. It's all simple to do. Just visit divinetravels.com forward slash hidden secrets 2023. You know you want to go on a cruise with me. River Moon Coffee, makers of the Fade to Black Blend. Truly the best coffee on planet Earth. Just visit rivermoonwellness.com or, or their Amazon store. It's all simple to do. You can check out the Fade to Black Blend, the Game Changer Blend, or any of their Black Moon Wellness products. It's the only coffee I drink. It is the best, and it's Doc. Again, rivermoonwellness.com all right welcome back our guest tonight craig campabasso that's right x39 man it's 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 right got the patch on right here on the base of my neck simple man 12 hours on 12 hours off x39 the links are below um you need to check it out it's how i got my vision back i haven't worn my reading glasses since the conscious life expo craig yeah, yeah. Oh, hold on. I've got you muted. That's my fault. That's uh, my fault. I'm reversing. The next time you see me, I'm going to look like I'm 22. Woohoo. Yeah, man. All right. Yeah, I feel it, it, it's weird. It's just weird, man. I got my vision back. It's crazy. It's crazy. That's um, really cool. Um, yeah, yeah. Check that out. Yeah, it's, 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 it's pretty cool. Um, the, uh, the areas around the country, um, uh, and I've I've visited uh, quite a few, and I've seen stuff that. And what I love the most, um, nighttime, yeah, you know, night vision, I, I get that. But I like the daytime stuff. Yeah, yes. that, that that that's the holy grail when when that when that goes down. Um, let's uh, let's everybody hear so much about the West Coast, and there's lots of reasons for that. Uh, there are some great places to go, and. And and I've seen a lot of stuff out here. But what about let's go up um, uh, in a general sense and talk about uh, the Northeast and, and New England? Well, I think 
one of my favorite one. Well, we love the uh, Allagash abductions, right? That uh, yeah. to go visit there, you would have to like charter a little tiny plane <laughs> that takes you in. It's like only two people can go at a time. But uh, you know, th this was um, you know when four guys went fishing and they actually got. Um, uh, abducted, but didn't realize it to many, many years later when they all started having these dreams with these ant beings, right? Mm -hmm. And through hypnosis, three of them uh, came to learn about, uh, you know, what they look like and uh, that kind of thing, and that they were these ant creatures. And now uh, a lot of people are talking about these different ant creatures online, uh, with some of them having some bases in Florida and things like that. Um, but uh, that was one of my favorite pine bush, like back in the uh, pine bush and, um, oh, what's what's the town? What's the, that whole uh, city called? P pine, pine bush. bush. Uh, it, it'll come to me in a second. But yeah, I'm trying to think that... of... Uh, when you go, when you go from Maine um, all the way down to, well, let's let's call it New York, even the Hudson Valley. Hudson Valley, that's what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, that that's that it. that whole area um, is 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 there one specific spot besides the Hudson Valley, or would you just call the Northeast in general a hotspot because Vermont? Yeah, you know, it's got a lot of sightings and. Uh, I would say all of that is a hot spot, right? Because we know in the 80s, they were having major uh, major sightings of these sort of manta ray looking black ships. There were, I think, identified at least eight different shapes during that time. That's right. Uh, Pine Bush also saw a lot of different things. And talking to some of the MUFON people there, they talked about um, an extraterrestrial uh, uh, and military base being built beneath their city. And that in, um, uh, I'm not sure what, uh, it, it's, it was called Tuxedo. It's a, it's a town that is um, uh, fully guarded. Yeah, it's uh, radio, radio silenced. Yeah, so it's that kind of thing. So let's say, let's say, if you knew somebody there, you they would take you to that person's house and make sure that you went in that person's house if you were a guest. Right? You can't just drive. So there were all of these, but uh, interestingly enough, there's an actor I work with because, you know, I, I, I do talk about this stuff with actors all the time just to get their own experiences. And uh, this one actor who I've just uh, uh, worked with last year uh, who, who called me many, many years ago, and that's how we became friends, uh, is our common uh, interest in UFOs uh, or UAPs. And... Um, uh, so he lived, uh, when he was living, uh, um, in upstate New York, right. He would see these giant manta ray ships come out over their town at night, right. Just a farm town that goes to sleep at nine o'clock at night. Um, so he would photograph them. And then he noticed that what would happen is, um, that they would send out a plane which he believed what they were doing was doing um, like night vision on the ground to see if anybody was around, right? And so he would get a uh, one of those uh, metallic tarpy things, you know, that doesn't show your body heat. And then he would watch the ships and he would film them. Now, he said that about an hour away from there, he would sometimes go to an ashram. He would stay there till they closed at midnight. And when he came out one night uh, across the street is a school and above the school was a giant ship hovering right above the school. Right. And he said, he just sat there frozen. He couldn't believe it. And, um, and then another time when he came out, he said that uh, 
a ship was there, but this time on the top, it had a turret. And he said, it looked like uh, it had a face and that it had like some kind of alligator skin. And he said, that was really, really uh, freaky to see because it would turn and it could view everything. Now, he said it started to move off and he decided he was going to follow it. And he started speeding and he actually got stopped by a, a cop. And, you know, the cop wanted to see his driver's license. And he said, well, you know, I was speeding because of something. And anyway, long story short, he finally confessed to the cop what it was. And the cop's eyes, he said, got really fearful. And he said, um, oh, my God, they're back. Right. And so he just let them go and that kind of thing. So he did get these things um, on camera as well. And a lot of people did in the 80s and even Whitley Strieber, you know, the Hudson Valley is where all of his things happened as well. And you have Betty and Barney Hill, you know, we can't yeah. forget, that, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And the thing is, is with, um, uh, you know, with uh, Betty and Barney, what was fascinating is what, you know, the leader looked more human, but was very different looking than the other uh, beings that tended to look like smaller um, grays. I think, you know, when we say the term gray, a lot of people think negative, but uh, these uh, Tibetan and Barney were not uh, negative creatures and that kind of thing. So uh, I've, I've got a, I know we're not talking about uh, uh, the uh, Southwest or the West anymore, but this question came in uh, from Susan Alloway. She wants to know about uh, the uh, Anza Borrego Desert, uh, which um, is out here in in Central California. Um, uh, you know, in that whole uh, uh, you know, it's just south of uh, Palm Springs, right in the flatlands, right there. Um, it, it, do you know anything about that area? Well, I don't know about that area, but we know that there is lots of activity down, uh, of course, in uh, the Yucca Valley and Landers where Giant Rock and the Integratron are, right? There's been many, many crafts sighted there, um, especially at Giant Rock. I mean, in 19 August, I think 24th, 1953 is when George Van Tassel met a uh, man uh, who who came in uh, in the desert when he was running the airport there. Uh, George woke up, he was sleeping on a cot outside and went and conversed with the man and he asked him if he would like to see the inside of the spaceship. Uh, he, took a, he took a ride. Uh, Saul Gonda was his name. Now, mm -hmm. I, I was able to talk to Daniel Boone, who was his... Um, married to one of his daughters towards the end of his life. And he, he told me he, he saw it from afar because you could see where, from where they lived to where giant rock is. So you could see if a ship or something had landed there. And um, so he was really, really fascinating to, uh, to talk to. Um, I have to go back and watch the tape because we, we actually filmed him um you know just to have it as a as a history piece you know for for that uh you know the sisters that own the integratron they like to um document as many things as possible so you know we even had bob short come out Lori wagner and i uh and another group of people and he channeled for the first time in a lot of years and we filmed them and uh, and uh, we, uh, one of the shots of him channeling with giant rock and right above it is a craft high up in the sky, right? So that was interesting. And, um, but that, to me, that was one of the most fascinating stories was the George Van Tassel story. Because, yeah, I love, the, I love the Van Tassel story. Yeah. What, I, what I did, um, and I reckon every time George comes up, I, I turn around and, and, and say what I'm about to say. Do yourself a favor. Jump down the Van Tassel rabbit hole. Just, yes. do, it. Just do it. 
And then um, as you start your journey with George Van Tassel, find his public speaking that he did at all the Rotary Clubs, the Lions Club, whatever, these yeah. different places in the 1950s, because they all got recorded and they're all online. And go and listen to him speak, um, 1953, 54, 55. Yeah. Um, there are dozens and dozens of his uh, conferences where he would go out and 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 speak these engagements at these uh, different uh, clubs around Southern California. It's extraordinarily great listening, and one of um, uh, one of the points with George. Uh, I don't mean to ramble. You're my guest, but one of the things that uh, George um, did not one specific thing it was a broad was how he talked about. Um, the technology and what yeah. he saw and, right. and, and things. It wasn't the, be, because, and, and, and Craig, I'm being very serious about this. Yeah. If he was influenced by film, B movies, right? Right. The, the monster from the moon, whatever those movies were from 1952, 53, 54. Um, and you saw the interior of these spaceships, they were big meters, right? Or levers right. or, or things, you know, and he's describing uh, flat screen monitors, you know, and, 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 and touching and they, he didn't describe the technology of the day. He didn't describe no. that. No, he, he, he had another, he had another experience and saw what he saw, and he he really uh, goes into detail with this. And you listen to it today, and you can picture exactly what he is talking about. I am yes. sure that people uh, from you know 1953, 54, when they're listening to George, had no idea what he was, he was talking. So about. he was so articulate, so yeah. articulate in everything that he talked about. I mean, he, he, you know, I mean, I, literally Giant Rock and the Integratron and George are sort of like the birthplace of ufology. Do you, he, do you know that he built a time machine in Santa Monica? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So he does this um, interview. It's um, uh, the interviewers from like Wales or Scotland, right? He's got this accent and it, it's for television. It's black and white. I think it's yeah. 1964 is when yeah. this interview took place. George is in a suit. The two of them, it's a talk show. They're both sitting there. And George tells this story, and, and he falls short of giving the address of the building. But he says, and again, you got to think about 1964. He says that he, was, he had uh, been given the designs for a time machine and they built it in Santa Monica. And he's like, we, we built it on Santa Monica Boulevard and fourth street or something. Right. And, and he says, uh, um, and, and it's working. And <laughs> you're listening, you're like, what? And he says, well, it's not a time machine, but you can view events seven years ago. It can't go past that. But anything seven years and, and before, you can watch it on a TV. And he says, that's because, wow. he goes, everything is recorded. And so you just go. It's, it's, it's in nature. It's recorded magnetically. And so you can use this device and, and we can go back. And it, it was like the craziest thing. And it was um, uh, how do I say this? It was like a modern conversation. This wasn't a 1964 conversation. It was just weird and so articulate. Um, and he's matter of fact, man. He's just sitting. Yeah, oh yeah, total matter of fact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Absolutely. <laughs> um, what about, um, let's. Uh, so and, and everybody, George Van Tassel. What, what just remarkable, remarkable story um, yeah. behind him. Um, and he he did the original contact in the desert. You know, he had 
10, 15,000 people out there every he did. year. He did. I've actually got a videotape of when it was at the height of its heyday, right? And uh, and in the UFO hotspot, uh, the very first chapter is dedicated to Giant Rock and the Integratron. And it would, does go into George talking about uh, what it looked like on the inside of the ship. Now, he never describes Salgonda all in one interview. I had to go through so many interviews. One interview, he would say this, his hair was blonde and short. Another one, he was 5'6". Another one, the people on his craft were also 5'6". Right, that kind of thing. So I actually had an artist do an artist conception of what Salgonda would look like and put that in the book as well. So um, I worked with a historian of Giant Rock. Um, of course, my uh, dear friend, Athena, um, she is still alive and she was with George when George began his first channelings with extraterrestrials underneath Giant Rock in 1952. Uh, Bob Short was also there. Uh, she told me she was there the very first time that he channeled Ashtar. I actually have all of, all of those little brief channelings, the dates and what the beings' names were. And then that brought for Salgonda in the following year also to him. So all of that's in there. I mean, both of them, the, the Integratron sisters and uh, Barbara Harris, who's the uh, um, uh, historian, you know, they both said when they read the chapters uh, on those two things, they said, God, you know, there's stuff in there we didn't even know, right? And now you just told me something that I didn't even know, and I don't even know if they know. I mean, that's fantastic. Yeah, it's an incredible interview. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, I'll, I'll send you the link. Oh, I've please. gone back and watched it so many times. Yeah. And uh, I did the the Van Tassel thing for years. And, uh, you know, and you find this, it's, it's literally a treasure trove of uh, all of his, he, he must have had a buddy, you know, uh, with the Rotary Club, right? Yeah. Because that, he, that, that was his thing. And you can, the, the, they're, they're, they're all there online, those uh, Rotary Club uh, presentations. And thank, you know, thank goodness that they were recorded. Uh, yeah, that you know, right? especially back then, that's a rare thing, um, and they they're, they sound wonderful. They're incredible. They're just so well archived. Um, now yeah, look those up. Yeah, yeah. And now, um, what about? Oh, uh, I wanted to turn around uh, and and talk about Shag Harbor for a second because. Sure. Shag Harbor is, is to me, one of the most documented uh, cases out there. Yes. Uh, we, we have Rendlesham. We have Roswell. Um, we have, you know, the Westall uh, School in, in Australia, right, where we have these things really well documented. Ariel, of course, in Zimbabwe. Um, they, you know, these cases that were documented. And Shag Harbor is one of those and i don't know why we don't talk about shag harbor the way we talk about zamora and socorro you know i i don't right i i don't i don't get yeah. that but you know we can talk about roswell but shag harbor and and that if canada has got one thing in their back pocket they've got one of the most incredible uh ufo contact cases uh in history they definitely do. It took place on October 4th, 1967. And uh, um, anyway, so it looked like there was this craft that was in the sky. And nobody was thinking this was a UFO, by the way. And as it started making its descent, uh, crashing about two to 300 yards uh, off the shore, um, there was a young man named Laurie Wickens. He was 18 years old. He had his girlfriend with him and some other friends. And they actually witnessed it crash into the ocean. So they immediately uh, called um, the police. They came out. 
Um, they were very concerned that uh, if a plane went down that uh, they wanted to get the survivors. So they rowed out in a boat. Um, they didn't find anything, but as they were rowing out, what they did see was sort of like this orb, um, sort of a glowing yellow, orangey orb bobbing in the water and all of this yellow foam that spread out far and wide around it, right? Now, as they got closer, it sank. And so uh, what they did is they got a couple of fishermen to come out and then more boats came out. And they, when they didn't find anybody, um, I think it was a, a couple days later, uh, they had the, um, uh, the Navy come out. They, you know, they went down, they couldn't find anything. So, uh, so nobody really thought that this was a UFO until the next day they started calling it a UFO. Well, right? the RCMP showed up. Yeah. There that's were right. reports of um, uh, U.S. military, possibly uh, United States Air Force uniform personnel on the scene as well. Um, I think um, a U.S. Navy boat eventually yeah. showed up there. Two days later, yes. Yeah, two days later. Yeah. So yeah. this was a really big deal. Now, the the other part, because Shag Harbor, uh, it's a fishing town, right? And the you know the 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 fleet of fishing boats went out and uh, were parked out there, you know, thinking they were looking for survivors of a plane crash, right? You know, at the time. But they converged on that area, and everybody spoke about the same things, that they did see a light under the water um, and that this yellow foam was everywhere. But when they tried to scoop it up, it would dissolve out of their hands, and, right. and they were never really able to to get the real stuff because it just uh, it, it, it dissolved back into water right. when it was yes. touched. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Chris, uh, I talked to Chris Stiles about that, who was a MUFON investigator. So uh, he said the same thing. He said uh, that they, there was just nothing there that they could even test, you know, because it did. It just melted away. Now, so back in 93, Chris Stiles and Doug Ledger, they revived the incident. And uh, so what they did is they went and they interviewed uh, the original witnesses, including the Navy divers. Um, and what they discovered was that the UFO also, uh, or a USO, had been moved beneath the surface for 25 miles to Shellbourne Harbor, uh, which is close to a NATO submarine detection base, and that the USO remained there um, and the Navy vessel sort of moored above it, right? And then after a few days, they thought they would go down and uh, see see uh, what it is. Not, you know, they knew what it is, but they wanted to go down and investigate it. And um, anyway, but all of a sudden, a second craft underwater matching that craft pulled up alongside of it. So they just decided to watch it. And after about two weeks of watching it, then both ships went up out towards Maine and they both flew up and out of the water, uh, taking the secret of who and what they were. Now, um, uh, when we hear those reports, I mean, what it sounds to me, um, uh, what it sounds like is that the second craft came in and repaired the first one. That's right. It did. It did. That's exactly what they said. Now, Chris, uh, Chris said, um, now that we're, we're there were, I'm going to circle back because Chris is, uh, important here. Yeah. But weren't there reports of, um, uh, you could see the two craft at the same time below the surface and that some reported like sparks or possibly welding or, or something going on. I never heard that from Chris. Okay. Yeah, I never heard that from Chris, but but here's a few things that he did say. He said that the condom committee filed a report on Shag Harbor that claims that when the object met the water, it was two to 300 yards offshore, as we already know, 
Besides the three police officers, the report also listed 13 other witnesses to the crash. Uh, but there were a number of other circumstances surrounding the event that raised some questions. And here's a few of them. The US Navy flew a high altitude photo reconnaissance mission in the Shag Harbor area. Uh, NORAD launched a 35 minute strategic air command operation over the crash site that was noted in APRO's preliminary report. Mm. And uh, CFS Barrington Baccaro and CFS Shelbourne, the two nearest NORAD bases, drew half of their staff from U.S. military personnel. Uh, there was also talk of the second simultaneous search for the USO in the waters off Shelbourne County Government Point. This alleged research is not noted in the Ar uh, Canadian archival record, but a unrelated RCMP X-File refers to the Shelbourne operation, right? So, yeah, help me understand because I've I've heard both and the both versions of how this ended kind of conflict with each other, right? The initial reports were the craft is has crashed. Second craft comes in um, and is with the other craft for uh, quite a number of days and then appears to be repaired. And then they watched um, the craft go out of Shag Harbor, leave the harbor, and then fly away. And then the other reports, so you have that, and that seems right. to be from eyewitnesses that lived in Shag Harbor. You have that, and then you have the other reports that uh, a, a U.S. Navy salvage uh, ship that was there on location towed it to Shelbourne, which is 25 miles away. So if that happened, where did the second ship come in? Did that go into Shelbourne, or, or is... You know what I mean? It's like two. It two did. I, I would. I end. would tend to believe the Chris Stiles version because he talked to the uh, Navy divers. He talked to all of the witnesses, right? And that when when the craft went down, that's all at that original time that anybody thought is that it just sunk to the depths and maybe that's where it lay. But then when he they reopened it in 1993, after interviewing everybody, he found out that they said the ship went off to Shelbourne underneath the water. And then a few days later, a sister craft came in, which they don't know where that craft came from, right? And seemed to be there to help repair it. But, so. but did anything get towed? No, right? They uh, no. location in no. Shag Harbor. No, no, nobody, nobody, he never mentioned anything about it getting towed. Right. Such a fascinating case. And yeah. Now, there were, um, uh, before the craft crashed, it was sighted in the sky and, and made a turn um, all the way. Uh, as far south as the United States, it was seen out over the Atlantic Ocean, and then and made a turn in the sky um, and and headed towards Shag Harbor. Right there, there were multiple reports of of UFOs that same evening on the East Coast. Yes, and how they how it Chris described it is he said it nosedived at a forty five degree angle into the water, right. And during its descent, it made a whistling noise, then a whooshing sound, and then a loud boom. Now, um, okay, so that's Shag Harbor. And, and in that area of uh, the, the extreme northeast, right, of, yeah. uh, of, of North America, have the sightings continued there? Uh, I haven't heard anything of the sightings uh, being there in Shag Harbor. You know, sometimes these are like one-offs and it seems to be like that's what it is. Um, here, like in Los Angeles and all these other things, you know, we know we see them all the time. I tell people to look up 
I mean, uh, I, I told the agent to uh, always look up into the sky. He did. He photographed a perfectly shaped silver donut, just like the ones from the Maury Island incident over Hollywood. Wow. Yeah, it was pretty amazing. And then a uh, producer director uh, caught one uh, on film as well and uh, that kind of thing. So uh, if, if you look up and you see something glinting, if you, 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 know, you have a good camera or whatever, you, you know, photograph it as close as possible. And then if you blow it up, you can see. But, but that donut shaped one was, I mean, it was perfect. It was like, it was no doubt that that's what it was. It wasn't blurry. It wasn't anything. It was like perfect. All I do is, especially uh, at night. No, I do. I'm looking up all yeah. the time. I'm, I'm never looking at my feet. I don't care if I'm <laughs> driving. You know, I'll drive. One eye is is out the window. You know, constantly. Yeah. I am always looking. You just never know. You never know. Um, now, uh, what about uh, you know Roswell, New Mexico? Of course, we have Socorro, right? One of my favorites. we do, we do. Well, I think you know, I think that's a you know a really interesting thing. Um, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but uh, Dr. Frank Strange is you know a uh, stranger at the Pentagon. He uh, he produced a documentary called Phenomena Seven Point Seven which means 7.7 .7 of all cases are uh, unsolved or solved. I can't remember exactly what that meant. And it was one of the very first interviews that Lonnie Zamora gave in that actual thing. Now, when I used to go to Dr. Frank's office, I always saw the film sitting there, uh, you know, in a can. And, um, and when James Fox was doing, uh, not this past documentary, but the one before, he called me and uh and we really we did everything to locate that film and uh it just vanished i don't know what happened to it but uh but you know thank god we have things like un, uh, unsolved mysteries you can see uh you know the robert stack show they interviewed it they did a great job um of telling the story as well um you know, it was documented. Uh, J. Allen Hynek said it was one of his favorite cases. Everyone really believed Lonnie Zamora. And uh, although that there really wasn't any proof of it. Um, in the actual book, by the way, you know, I know a lot of people are very interested in this, but, you know, um, I give you the exact coordinates where that ship landed so if you wanted to go to it you could the exact coordinates of where Valiant Thor's ship is stationed at Lake Mead the coordinates where Adamski met uh, Orthon uh, you know and, uh, Travis where Travis's thing the exact coordinates to that that's a little uh, more harder um, but uh, you know because People like going to the sites and uh, just feeling the energy of those sites as well. Um, and, you know, in the book, everybody gets the story. But, uh, you know, at the, at the end of each chapter, you know, you get uh, the things to do in that area, the contacts, uh, the sources. If you want to read more, like I've got Chris's book in here, uh, which is really, really good, by the way. Um, with um with Valiant Thor, yeah, uh, it, it seems that where we have uh, photographs, right, we've got other visual stuff. Um, we've got an incredibly detailed story. Uh, be, where did Valiant Thor first surface? I'm just going to say in pop culture, let's just go there. You know, that what did that come from Frank or it did? It, it did. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Here, here's my hypothesis of, of the story, because, you know, remember I, I was very close to Dr. Frank the last seven, eight years of his life. I interviewed him every week about his adventures with uh, Valiant Thor, his crew being on board the ship, the starship, 
little things like that. Um, and, uh, and he, uh, he first met him on December 24th, Christmas Eve at the Pentagon in 1959. Uh, and then he again uh, met him in 1961. And uh, Valianthor stayed in touch with him. He invited him to tour Victor One in 1967. And that was the year that Dr. Frank released his book, uh, Stranger at the Pentagon, right? Yeah. Uh, about that story. Now, uh, I believe the date at the Menger Farm where the photos were taken by August Roberts, a retired Air Force photographer and amateur ufologist, um, I believe those were taken in 1958. Um, I think Valiant Thor knew that they weren't going to accept his proposal on how to uh, uh, eliminate sickness, disease, prolong life. Um, you know, he was grooming Eisenhower on the ways of the universe and, you know, uh, atomics and free energy and all of that kind of stuff. Um, uh, although Eisenhower and Nixon were for it, uh, it was the other powers that be, from what I understand, uh, that rejected it. So I believe that he took a little field trip knowing that he would be photographed. And how the photo ends up with Dr. Frank is quite an interesting story, is that August Roberts is there. This is in Highbridge, New Jersey. Dr. Frank is living with his first wife in New Jersey. And uh, as we know uh, with Howard Menger, there, uh, it was a UFO hotspot of extraterrestrials who were in contact with him from all over our galaxy, so says Menger, right? He also says he was taken to the backside of the moon, et cetera. He photographed Venusian craft and things as well. The same stuff that Adamski was photographing in the same era, right? Just on two different coasts. So uh, anyway, so the very next day, August Roberts calls Dr. Frank and says, um, I've got some pictures I wanna show you. And so he goes over and he shows it to him and he says, those are space people. And he says, well, how do you know they're space people? And um, uh, Howard had a secret handshake with the visitors. So if they shook his hand in a certain way, he knew they were a visitor. And August got confirmation from Menger that they did shake his hand in that way. Really? So, but do yeah. You know the, do you know the secret handshake? Well, Valiant Thor came to me in a dream because I wanted to know the secret handshake. And I, right. I said, can I shake your hand, sir? And he did. Okay, next time I'm with you, I'll I'll do it for you, dude. I want the I'll secret handshake. I'll 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 do it for you. Did so, you um, did you see the movie The Eleventh Green? No, what's that? Okay, you've got to check it. it. This, as far as ET contact movies go, yeah, this is uh, an independent film. This is tippity toppity top, uh, mm, right? The Eleventh Green. Um, I'm not too sure when it came out, um, but I saw it, I think I saw it shortly after it was released, so two years ago, um, somewhere in there. Um, and uh, so write it down, the 11th green. It's about the 11th green. It's uh, That's a golf reference, right? 11th green, the 11th hole. Um, Eisenhower. And it's the confessions of one of the people that worked with Eisenhower. So anyway, um, it, it all takes place in Palm Springs. I don't want to give away the movie, but right. in the movie is the Valiant Thor discussion with Eisenhower. It, it's part. It's, it's part of this movie. And wow. uh, it's a fascinating, it's a great, it, it, I, I don't want to get into any more than that because it's not going to be what you think. Right. Um, um, 
it, 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 you just got to watch it. The ghost of Obama is in there too, as well. Barack. It's you gotta see it, man. It's it's really <laughs> well done. It's called the Eleventh Green, and uh, Campbell Scott is is the star, and I think uh, he's a, he's a great actor. Um, but now back to Frank Strangis, okay, yeah. Valiant Thor. Do you remember the TV series? I love talking Hollywood stuff. You remember yeah. UFO, right? right. Okay, yeah. out of uh, 1969, 1970, 71, um, out of the UK. Um, there is an episode there. It, I, I think UFO was just one season, like 26 episodes or something. But one of the episodes, so they're doing this uh, uh, like a, a, a UFO talk show. In, in great it, 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 in this scene, they're looking at this TV screen. Then they cut to the set, but they're watching it on TV. And he goes, okay, so we're talking about the UFO phenomenon today and what contact may be. And we're talking with UFO researcher, Dr. Frank Strangis of the United States. And I look, and he, there he is. He's in an episode of UFO. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, with his glad thing. And he's just sitting there. He's in a suit. And, uh, yeah, yeah, you got to check it out. And he, he's well. it's pretty well spoken in this. And it's it's pretty interesting on on uh, his comments on how they are getting here. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty yeah. cool. Pretty cool. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you know, anyway, uh, August uh, told them the whole story. He gave them he gave him uh, some of the pictures, and Doctor Frank uh, Doctor Frank blew up one of Valiant Thor. He would put it on his board. He's in Washington D.C. Uh, in December, around Christmas time, 1959. And he spoke this particular night on UFOs in the Bible for this church. And he was a guest speaker, uh, a guest pastor for two weeks there, right? And, um, and afterwards, a woman approached him and said that uh, she must speak with him. And wait, she wait, points. Wait, 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 wait. I need to understand. Are you Valiant Thor? Was a guest pastor? No, no, no. Dr. Frank was. Oh, Dr. Frank was. Dr. Frank was. But what he did was is he would then blew up the picture of Valiant Thor and he put it up on the board with his other UFO pictures. And then he would just tell the story that August told him and say, this is an alleged man from somewhere else. So now we, we fast forward to uh, Washington, D.C. when he's giving this talk. After the talk, um, a woman comes up to him, flashes uh, her Pentagon badge, points to his picture and says, he wants to speak with you. And uh, Dr. Frank said, you have my undivided attention. They went back into uh, uh, the pastor's office. Uh, she picked him up the next morning, brought him to the Pentagon and uh, where he had uh, uh, anywhere, I think it was like a half hour to 40 minute conversation, um, with Valiant in a, just in a, in a room in the Pentagon, uh, you know, down a hallway. I mean, George Filer told me he was, he was there at the Pentagon during that time. And when he was walking down the hallway, one of the guys with him said, you know, uh, that guy's in there, that extraterrestrial's in there. So, uh, so that was a place where he would go and work out of uh, now, during the what, day. Look at what Camille. This is a married woman. Valiant Thor was hot. Hot, hot. yeah. Hot. Name too. Right. <laughs> I, I, am, I am so calling your husband after the show. Can you tell him what you're doing in the chat room. Camille is so cool. He's pretty darn handsome. Yeah, yeah he was. He, he he knew how to dress too. So um, now, is it true? We're almost out of time. Okay. That, but but this is what um, I remember in, in those famous photographs, right? With Valiant sitting, you know, in that row, you know, and he's got a crowd. That everybody in the picture has been identified, but him, right? That well, it, we can the, we, you know, everybody that's there, we know who they are, except for Valiant. Well, we there's Valiant. The guy next to him looking straight forward is his vice commander, Don. 
And then the blonde woman next to Dawn is Valiant's other vice commander, Zan's wife, and they call her Jill. Now, the other people that were around, I don't know who they are. I do know that Jim Mosley is sitting in the background when he was a very young man. Mm -hmm. I, I spoke to Jim about it several times. He doesn't even remember being there, but he said that was him um, as well. Gray Barker was there as well, um, you know, from Saucerian Press. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and that's, that's all. I mean, all those other people, I don't know who they were. I've never heard that they've been identified or anything of that nature. So what what do we do? I know you 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 made the movie, but what do we do with this Valiant Thor um, story? Do we do we chalk it up to fantastic writing and storytelling on the part of Frank, or uh, you know, and and it, you know, it's mythology, it's folklore, and 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 we'll just leave it right there. Or are we talking about a real event and a real person and he lived, you know, in an apartment underneath the Pentagon for a couple of years mm -hmm. and and that he was a he was a real figure and he's part of history. What what do we do with this? Well, I think that, you know, I'm I'm raising money to make the big feature film now as well, which will tell the big rounded out part of the story. Right. I, I just made the short film to raise the money uh, for that. But um, I, I look at it this way. I when, you know, I first met Dr. Frank, I always thought the story was fantastic. I always thought it was great. But, you know, everyone still has a little bit of doubt in their mind and that kind of thing. Um, but I will tell you what convinced me was um, several little things happened uh, this is the bigger one. Uh, I, I got very sick. I was sick for several days. I had to be rushed to the doctor's office. Um, I, I, my stomach was killing me. They gave me a bunch of stuff. Nothing worked. They put me in an ambulance, sent me to the hospital. Um, this was like an all-day affair. They took x-rays, said that I had a bowel obstruction and that I was going to have to be operated on in the morning. Uh, my friend, uh, she left me there. Um, and in the middle of the night, I woke up in twilight. He has another vice commander named Teal. Um, and I know what Teal looks like. And I felt her standing over me. And all of a sudden, I felt zillions of tiny little bubbles going through my intestines. And I just knew when I woke up in the morning, I was going to be fine. Now, I went back into sleep, and when I woke up in the morning, I was on my side, and who was sitting in the chair next to my bedside is Dr. Frank Stranges. And he said, Teal called me early this morning, told me to get down here and tell you that she fixed you up last night. So when the doctor came in, I said, I feel 100% better. They did, they redid the x-rays, everything was fine, and I walked out of the hospital that afternoon. New Mexico. Yeah. Right? New Mexico. What is it? You know, and I, I understand Trinity and, and uh, you know, the atomic connection and Los Alamos right. and, and Oppenheimer and the crew. And I get all of that. I do. But um, it's not just Roswell. There have mm. been numerous significant events in the state of New Mexico. Um, and I, I'm sure that it predated the nuclear age uh, as well. What is it about New Mexico? Well, I, as we've seen over, over quite a, a lot of uh, time is that um, uh, UAPs are found uh, in and around military bases because they're keeping an eye on them. We know that they've turned off their nukes and then they've turned them back on. So I think they're around there. Um, there were, uh, God, I can't remember if it was Stephen Greer or who said it, but you know they were saying that 
some of the towers that they had up around uh, New Mexico, Los Alamos, and that kind of stuff were tripping up with the way that these saucers were flown, and that's what caused them to crash. Um, I have to go back and look at that, but there was something to that nature. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but uh, I mean, who knows? I mean, I, I don't know, but I think that they're definitely watching all the military bases. They're not gonna, they don't wanna let anything get blown up. I mean, there's one woman who actually, uh, father was in the military and she uh, was taken out into the middle of the desert because they were told they were gonna meet uh, somebody from another planet. And lo and behold, it was Valiant Thor and Dr. Frank Stranges was with him. And so I interviewed her and um, she said at that time, um, it was a lot about the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis and all of that. And they were terrified that, um, you know, everyone was gonna get blown up. And he said, you know, don't worry, that's one of the reasons that I'm here. That's one of the reasons that we're here. We're going to make sure that that never happens. Yeah, over um, Albuquerque, Los Alamos, and, and in that area in uh, the 1940s, they, the, the scientists there, and you have to remember, back then it wasn't what it is today. We're just talking about desert, right? Yeah. They uh, were seeing these green balls of light in the sky, sometimes in groups, um, over uh, Los Alamos and over Albuquerque. And it got so bad that they installed three sets of radar um, in a triangle. Yes, to, right. Yeah. To, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is way before Roswell. Well, and yeah. also after Roswell, too, as well. Yeah. But yeah. uh, uh, before all of this, and it, it, it's right there. You know? Yes, that's exactly what it was. It was the radar. Yeah. That's exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's crazy. That's crazy. what they talked about. That's amazing. Craig, the book is fascinating, and uh, you knocked another one out of the park, my man. Yay, thank you. It's called The UFO Hotspot. Uh, Craig's links are below. Um, you can get this. Uh, on Amazon, but also uh, this is a MUFON publication as well. It's published by MUFON, and uh, and Craig's websites are posted below too as well. Craig, yeah. you're the absolute very best, my man. Thank, Thank you. you. It was a great weekend, <laughs> and it was so cool to have you back on the show with us, man. Oh, Thank you so much, Jimmy. This was great. I want the secret handshake. I'll talk to you. Yes. Both. All right, bro. Bye. Craig Campobasso. The book, The UFO Hotspot Compendium, it is complete. It's illustrated. It's a fantastic book. I'm about halfway through it right now. So go and check it out. And uh, there you go. Uh, tomorrow night here, we are going to be talking about physics tomorrow night and uh, Einstein and relativity and what is really going on with our universe. And we might be getting into UFOs, craft, Propulsion Systems. We'll do all of that tomorrow night with Mark Fiorentino. Tomorrow night, right here on Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Fantastic show tonight. Craig Campobasso is the absolute very best. And uh, you've got to check out the book. It's great. It's out now. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee, Dennis, and Kevin. Announcer. <laughs> Webmaster is Drew the Geek Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy, SpaceboyMusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and this broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2023 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Till tomorrow night with Mark Fiorentino. Be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy.